Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Starseed Chats. Tonight, I have Mary Rodwell here with me. She is a uh, researcher, um, Australia's leading researchers in the UFO and contact phenomenon. She is the author of Awakening How Extraterrestrial Contact Can Transform Your Life. I absolutely love that title, by the way. It, it's been it very, nice. very, very transformative. Um, and you've researched over... 3,000 cases, which is uh, pretty impressive. So you've been uh, in this for a very long time, and I know you also focus on uh, the children and, and do a lot of ses sessions with children. Um, so I'm excited to dive into all of this with you. Thank you so much for coming on, Mary. You're most welcome. And the children primarily are in my second book, which is The New Human where it tells some of their stories as well. Because what I discovered was that it wasn't just the adults having contact, that it's intergenerational and it comes through family lines. And most often if someone adult who's had a, an interaction, if they've got children, often the children are very much involved as well. Yeah. So do you think um, even if parents don't remember that they have had contact have you found through sessions with the children that children who may possess these kind of heightened abilities or having these contact experiences it's been generational the whole time even if the parents aren't aware of it do you know anything about that um to a certain extent i think with parents they don't you know if they're not very informed they may be very surprised to find out their child is talking about going up on a spacecraft they may be three four or even five years old talking about what they learn on the spacecraft they may talk about past lives on other planets and what have you and when i talk to the parents often the parents haven't realized that they've been having contact too and it may not be all conscious memory but they may have always felt different felt they've never belonged felt like they've been adopted felt you know like this isn't home um they've may maybe seen lights in the sky or they've made had maybe had missing time episodes where something's happened but they've not realized it's all connected to the fact that they are also experiences and that's why i send out my um questionnaire because there's things in that that people don't realize it actually are all the patterns that mm -hmm. tell me that something's gone on for them and when they realize that they realize then why their child is coming out with this and it actually is very I will say to your audience it's not like the parents you know are programming the kids to think that they're having experiences often it comes way out of the blue the parents have had no idea that this you know that they're why they're coming out with this because it's not something they see on cartoons or on the television when they talk about I came from another planet I was blue and I've come here because I've got something to do on this planet this is my first life yeah, these are not things you discuss normally with six, five, six, seven year old children. So when they come out with it, it, it is the parents are completely surprised and know it's not them. So unless it's imagination, then it's something real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, and, and that's a good point. Bringing up the manifestations of contact, it doesn't necessarily have to be little, you know, green men or beings showing up in your bedroom that that you remember it contact can come in many different ways and it can sometimes even be subtle um so yeah that's a uh, pretty interesting do you think the children now are you, how long have you been working with children is that something more new no um in fact it it's almost part of when it first was a, um, a phenomenon that i was looking at because the very first gentleman that came to see me and he came to see me because he'd heard I was open minded and he said, there's no support groups for this. For this, they just think you're crazy. Um, and he told me about his partner and his and the children were having things happen. So right from the very beginning, I knew this was a family affair. Mm -hmm. You know, this um, and not only was it a family affair, you could trace it back often to the parents of the adults. You know, so, you know, the paternal uh, grandmother or grandfather, because I would say to them, 
did your mother or your, did your father or your grandfather or ever mention it was a, a bit different? Um, or um, and they would often say, oh, my granddad was always interested in UFOs or mm -hmm. my grandma was a bit, little bit psychic or she was a little bit fey, you know. There's your link right away. They may not uh, in those generations understood what was going on, but their mere focus or their behavior was a great indicator that it was coming through that family line. And it's and it is generational in terms of acceptance that this is a reality because it's only in the last very much, you know, from when I first started, I think it was in 1995. I've been going on with this for a long time now is to see the even in the, those short years up to 2024 now, that there's been a huge shift in public awareness and, and public consciousness that has gone to accepting and talking about this. Whereas, you know, when I first got into it, it was really woo-woo out of this, you know, people are crazy, you know, you're not one of those, you know, tin hat people, you know, tin fall hat people and all the rest of it, was very much the consensus in the, in the 90s. Mm hmm. Wow. So with the children now, are you seeing uh, a difference from whenever you first started the type of sessions that you're doing and the information that's coming through from when you first started in, in more recent times? I think the what I've noticed is with the experiences, because I don't call them abductees, because that's a, a different terminology. It has very negative connotations. Mm -hmm. and many people down the track realize that in fact th there's often been a consent which they didn't realize at the time so it's it's far better you know to use the term experiencer or for someone star seed star kids or whatever what i found is there's more acceptance of more of the the information like not just they've been taken up on a, a spacecraft and maybe had a medical procedure or something like that what has evolved from that is far more of a communication and an equality where many feel they're part of these, these uh, star nations that are visiting us, that they all feel that they're part of their origin rather than are oh, there's an us and them kind right. of feeling. It's not so much us and them anymore. It's, well, actually, they're my star family. Yeah. And I've agreed to come down here in this form to be part of the um, activation and awakening of humanity you know, mm -hmm. this, this ascension process or whatever. So it's become a lot more um, commonplace for that to be the theme rather mm -hmm. than, oh, I was taken and these little grey beings took this from me and that from me and did this and did that. When, when you find out more of their connection, often they will see that there's a connection. And it could be to some really unusual forms of beings and not just humanoid Pleiadian type, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what we call, you know, more normal humanoid beings. There's mantis beings, there's cat beings, you know, feline beings, there's light beings, there's a whole range of, you know, uh, different forms of beings that people interact with and will connect to them. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to a little eight-year-old some months ago she, she said, I'm a hybrid. And I said, what, you know, what does that mean? And she said, I'm part water being and part human because I come from a water planet. And she actually drew what she looked like. She said, when I look in the mirror, I'm seeing my water being self. Wow. And she, she explained that she's come as part water being, part human. And she, she described a really interesting awareness, which was to do with music. And she explained to me that the music that she hears is not just hearing it and feeling it. She goes on the on the frequency of that music to where the person who created it created it and why they created it and their emotions involved. So, in other words, she's got more of a complete package of that um, music frequency than we normally would have. The depth of her understanding was quite astounding at eight years mm -hmm. old. So, what I'm finding is the children before they get programmed out of it, yeah. <laughs> often they do through education, what I'm noticing is that their awareness of so many things that we we have, we ultimately, you know, have been told are impossible, like communicating with animals, communicating with plants, mm -hmm. affecting elements, knowing about healing and bringing in star languages. All of that now 
is coming out because the kids are a lot more open than the parents who are a little bit wary or cautious of telling you what's going on with them. And they'll mm. eventually maybe tell you this, but they won't be as open as the children who are, you know, naturally, what's the problem? Doesn't everyone do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. And so you mentioned that she sees herself like that in the mirror. Mm. That's really, really fascinating. I've had an experience where the the first star being I ever saw, who was my star family, uh, a light blue um, Andromedan council being with no hair. She began communicating and contacting me. I first saw her UFO. Then I saw, you know, a, a vision of her and we began communicating. And after a while, there was a point where um, the communication seemed to kind of like stop. And I, you know, was wondering, like, where did she go? And I was uh, in the bath and I looked straight ahead at, uh, you know, like this, the spigot. And in the reflection, I saw her <laughs> in, in my reflection. <laughs> So I, I took that as a sign as I, she was integrated within mm. me and I, and I can still make contact with her too, but also she is me. Like yes. I anchored yes. that in. Yes. Very, very fascinating. Um, so I wanted to ask, do you think the kind of the, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Almost like the the shape shifting aspect of it, and the kind of taking on like different forms, or is kind of a little confusing to me. Have you heard a, like had a lot of cases where that's come up? Well, we hear about the shape shifting of the reptilians mm -hmm. or dracos or whatever that yeah. um, can look human and what have you. But um, I've had several reports of individuals over the years that said they've looked at someone who's looked human and then they've not looked human like yeah. they can see beyond the form and it's not you know necessarily a reptilian it's it's just an alien you know what we'd call an extraterrestrial form mm -hmm. um and what i we know is many of these these different uh star beings and these otherworldly beings that are you know coming to see us uh can wander around and they can look human and it's only when you have that ability you can actually see past the form that they're showing you and actually see what what they really are when i've introduced people to what i call their life guide or that you know um often the life guide will present something initially that looks very human and then they'll show and then when the person's ready to see well actually this is my other form and it could be um a mantis being it could be um, you know, a, a, a blue being, or it could be um, one of these many other forms. So sometimes they don't want to frighten people by not looking human, but their real form is what we have to learn to accept. Yeah. And I think this is this is us being desensitized to the fact there are all forms um, that, and many, a lot of them are humanoid, but we've got, you know, we've got light beings, we've got feline beings we've got a whole range from them you know the mantis to mm -hmm. ever dolphin like beings and we've also you know in recent um re you know research that i'm doing many people are having interactions with the sasquatch or yowies as they call them in australia and those are star beings as well they're interdimensional and um with one gentleman who is communicating with um, a particular um band in in north america brian Bla band is his name and he has a he has a a show as well he wanted to know his why was he being contacted by and and having this family this tribe that was connecting to him and he found that he'd had in regression three lifetimes as a sasquatch himself wow. so that was the reason that he was so often what we're connecting to is our our, our soul origin or our yeah. star when we come to this planet and they're helping us and supporting us through the human journey because we're on the ground being part of this mm -hmm. big shift in consciousness right we're like the the feet on the ground first yes. person exactly. perspective we're in the middle of it <laughs> exactly. i love the sasquatch by the way i absolutely love working with them they are fantastic um, and that brings up an interesting point. Uh, so I'm contacted by 
there's not just one type of being. I see many, many different types of beings. And uh, it seems to be most of them or many of them are, are uh, past star families or yeah. past or even versions of me from the future or versions of me from, you know, the past or parallel realities. That's just so it can really go on infinitely. That's the thing that changes the perception of us and them. Many years ago, I remember uh, a mother telling me that her daughter had said to her when she was eight years old, Mommy, we are the aliens. And really what that says is exactly that, that, you know, it's not an us and them. In fact, you know, when people open up to their star origins and often when I'm working with someone in hypnosis or helping them to connect, I'll say to ask to the superconscious what other star origins are related to your being human at the moment on this planet. And many will come up with, it could be Andromeda, Arcturus, it could be Pleiades, it could be Sirius, or it could be another dimension or a planet we don't even know or whatever. But they often will find that in that altered state, the superconscious will give them the information of yeah. their connection. And then they realize that they've incarnated as human because they've got a mission or a plan, you know, a, um, a soul adventure on this planet but part of it is this mission to assist with what's going on and it makes a complete it changes the whole way they view their interactions and their communication mm -hmm. yeah definitely um so your your newest book i believe you said is the new human yes uh, can you tell us a little bit about that what what that's about and what is the new human your perspective of it when I wrote Awakening, primarily it was because so many people didn't know where to go, how to help themselves through the process of accepting their contact and understanding why me, what's it all about, how do I know it's real, all those kind of things that everybody wants to know and not the resources out there at the moment, certainly conventionally, to give them answers. So I wrote a book that was geared to helping them through how do you know it's real what kind of things are happening? What do you do about the fear? How do you get to understand more of if you start writing scripts or coming with star language? What is all of that? So it was a book to give them, if you like, steps into their own journey and learning about themselves. The new human is some of the stories um, and, you know, that how people are understanding their contact, what the children say about their experiences, how they're connected to various um, beings, star beings or whatever, and their, their understanding of their awareness. So they'll talk about, you know, I remember an eight-year-old that came to this very office. <clears throat> Not only did he tell me what that picture is that you see by the side of my head um, in terms of what that was and the, that he'd been down those paths past the planets into a, another dimension, wow. but he also told me that when he was on board craft, that he would be amongst a group of other children. Some of them were human and some of them, he said, didn't look quite human. And he explained to me how they were using their mind and being taught how to use their mind and their, their abilities to move things and being taught complex, he said, complex um, information. And I said to him, so can you tell me about this complex information? He said, no, because it's too complex for you. <laughs> so... This is an eight-year-old explaining to me that I wouldn't understand. Wow. <laughs> but he said that he communicates with animals and that he's here to help people understand the consciousness of animals and not to treat them badly, and that was part of his mission. So I felt it really important because they're not so compromised by programming at that early age that they, you know, many get shut down as they go to school, told it's not real or don't want to be different. So the stories before that happens, what they remember, the parents would come to me and say, you know, uh, my, my son's talked about going to school at night or whatever. And because so many parents have said my kids are having these experiences as well, it was a resource for them to see that, you know, what other children come out with and how to understand that. But also because there's another very important part of the book, and that is because many of those we are seeing as dysfunctional because mm -hmm. they don't. They don't behave as we do or what they think is normal, like ADHD, Asperger's, dyslexic, some forms of autism. 
those are what I discovered was many of the children born to the experiencer were having these labels. Mm -hmm. And I remember wondering, well, why, why are they considered dysfunctional? They, you know, many of them are multidimensionally aware and what have you. And it's because they're multidimensionally aware and different that they're seen as dysfunctional and given these labels, where in fact, as one gentleman gave me a clue to that, he's in his 50s at the time, and he said, Mary, I realize I would be now diagnosed as ADHD, he said, but what I remember as a child, I would see things in a in far of a multidimensional way than the average. And he, he called his book uh, Close Encounters of the ADHD Kind, but what he was describing was, he would say ADHD for me was always dialed into higher dimensions. So oh. what hap happened was I realized that these are new programs of human, given these labels because they're very different, but what they really are is showing more multidimensional abilities. And what do we do with ADHD? Conventionally, we dumb them down. We give them medication to slow them down so that they can be programmed. Well, I believe these intelligences saw that was what was going on on this planet, that we are all being dumbed down through education, science, you know, religion, mm -hmm. all these different programs that shut us down. And so they've created a different way or made it harder mm -hmm. to um, do that, to actually break down those, those barriers of awareness, which is what the older generations were taught, oh, it's not real, you're crazy, something mm -hmm. wrong with you. So, in fact, I talk about ADHD, Asperger, all of those, and what you can do to assist them to normalize in the sense without drugs. And I had a wonderful lady, Dr. Lena Olson, who's a molecular biologist, who had all those labels. And she came across understanding that ADHD need more choline in their diet and a few other things. And then you don't need to you don't need to dumb them down. You just give them the right diet and what have you and also to explain the differences in you know the um the aspergers who's who's extremely intelligent but also has this ability to be too honest well if you want to break down a system you need those that are too honest and so <laughs> their ability and i explain that but i also talk about um not only what you can do to help your kids but also looking at you know, what happens with religion and how the different religions um, are not always telling the truth in terms of what's going on. And also stories, I've got a medical doctor who had an activation in India and now activates DNA. So it's it's taking it to a whole new level of acceptance. And that's why I wrote the book, because yeah. it, it really was giving people permission to own their truth. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, I was watching an, another interview of yours before this, and you mentioned a nine-year-old. So speaking about the programming, the negative programming that we are bombarded with um, in these children, you shared a, a story about a nine-year-old who was taken to an underground base, and the, this programming didn't work on them. Could do you know what I'm talking about? And yeah. can you can you share that? Because I I thought that was fantastic and good news. <laughs> Well, the thing is that obviously there are covert groups on this planet, deep state, lots yeah. of names given to them that know about all of this. You know, if I know about it, they sure do. And they've known about these new generations of human and want to access their abilities for their own ends and also to stop them from compromising their agendas and whatever. And unfortunately, that's the dark side of humanity. Um, we, you know, we're always trying to find bad, bad ETs, aren't we? But what about the, the humans that are not um, caring about their own species? He describes that he was taken to an underground base. He was put in a chair and a lady in front of him was in a, a, a black uniform and she had technology to one side. And what he described was that she was trying to bring down his frequency so that he, um, this program would be, um, he would be affected by this, these frequencies, these programs that would lower his frequency and program him into a different state, a negative state. He was aware of what she was doing. And so what he did was I deliberately kept my frequency too high for that to happen. So he, he was perfectly 
cognizant of what she was actually trying to do. And the thing is, that's what they're dealing with, highly intelligent, aware souls. Some of them still get caught up in it that are not as strong. And it may be that, you know, that often they're not as strong if they're in a family where they're not given the support they need. So they maybe are more vulnerable. Sometimes that's why it happens. But the, you know, the, um, the star beings know this is going on and they do their very best to protect and support the, the soul, you know, the star being soldiers on the ground that are there to, and, and, and that's what the indigos primarily are, is they're warriors, you know, they're spiritual warriors. They've come in to, to actually challenge the system and to change the system. And unfortunately, some will be too sensitive to actually manage that. Um, and get through it and that's what's really hard because you're challenging everything you're challenging education you're challenging spirit uh, spirituality and their awareness of who they are I remember and I wrote about it in my book uh, in terms of an Indian a young young adult Indian who said who wrote to me saying I'm a star seed he said mm -hmm. but my problem he said is most of my countrymen um, worship about a hundred gods <laughs> He said, you know, they, they've got all these gods. And he says, but Mary, I know they're not gods. I know they're ETs. But how do I tell my family? How do I tell others that that's, that's what they're worshipping? Because they won't believe me. Mm -hmm. So he feels very isolated with his awareness because all around him, they still got the old beliefs. And he can see right through it. So they've got this as a challenge as well. They may be born into a, a religious family. And I've met several like that where they and one young man told me that it was he didn't want to disappoint his parents because they were very very religious and you know he loved them but he knew he was a star seed and he said that i can't take on board what they want and he was quite suicidal over mm -hmm. it so it can be that profound and that difficult so you know the more we can support the parents of these children the more chance we have of, of at least allowing this to be part of the you know to help with this whole shift right yeah and you uh mentioned indigo children or yeah the indigos being uh more of like the the warriors is there mm. an age group for the indigos that you know of or it's like a time period i think the indigos have been coming in probably in the last 30 40 maybe even 50 years in, mm -hmm. in more and more numbers depending on what what's actually going on because even the older generation such as my, my generation i think have come in as kind of spiritual warriors as well wanting to challenge the system because i meet quite a few around my sort of generation that are very passionate about challenging what's going on on the planet right now from multiple levels uh, right. uh, as well so it really is it's an energy it's a frequency i mean some have come in as crystal, crystalline, uh, rainbow, golden. Mm -hmm. And usually that represents something. It could represent healing. It could represent, em you know, they're more empathic than others. And so uh, may maybe, you know, more will be drawn to healing or whatever. And mm -hmm. some to do with the earth energies. I've met many that are working with changing uh, the ley lines or energy lines of the planet or re um, reconnecting them. In different places and and different power sources and what have you. So there's, it's multiple levels of awareness that are, that have been coming in for the last hundred years. I suspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. I was curious about that. In the uh, the grid work is something that I've been called to a lot this past year. Uh, in your interview, you act, one of your interviews, you actually mentioned how uh, the pyramids, a, a child. Uh, talked about how the pyramids were going to be reactivated. And I was told that as well during a session with my star family. And you said that the pyramids are supposed to have water around them. And I thought that was super, just super fascinating. Well, it was told to me by this nine-year-old who wow. knows that he, he goes to the different um, sacred sites because he gets downloads and each one he goes to. And he explained that's how they actually work. They needed to be surrounded by water as part of the uh, the ability for the the um, pyramids to actually activate and become what they are, which is you know um, providers of power and energy. Mm 
-hmm. and they need, and it needs the right consciousness as well mm -hmm. so you, this is what when they talk about you know they were um burial chambers and of course that's absolutely ridiculous more and more we're understanding now what the pyramids can do the trouble is they've been deactivated i actually know um uh, several have suspected that the capstone is actually crystal mm. been taken um and probably hidden for yeah. that very reason as well yeah. but it's it's um it's all part of this uh this new grid that will be activated at some point mm -hmm. to help the what we call you know the ascension or or whatever name you want to give it when we're getting to that higher frequency but mm -hmm. i i remember a story many many years ago and i always remember how interesting it was it was an anecdote from a little five year old that was being told by his mother showing him pictures of the pyramid and all the slaves you know building the pyramids and he got very cross with her and said mum that's rubbish because i was there <laughs> And they changed the density structure of objects large and small and they levitated them into place. Wow. So, just like that. It's not true. This is how it worked. And I've never forgotten that. I thought that was quite amazing. That is incredible. We need to have them teaching the classes. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's so amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, mention this, the space arcs coming up uh talking about kind of like lost technology or things that have been deactivated the space arcs you know i don't know too much about them but it recently came up for me personally uh whenever i was doing a remote viewing of the miami mall which okay. i thought was super interesting yeah. there was a space arc aspect involved oh. um and Beth Noyes, I know that uh, you've done a session with her. And could, could you tell us your understanding of the space arcs and, and what has what you found about what the space arcs are? They're uh, from Atlantis, I think, right? Or some of them possibly were hidden during Atlantis. I, I'm still uncovering or unpacking yeah. what I know about that right. and connecting a lot of the dots. With Beth, she started me on that yeah. particular aspect because she, in her regression, she realized she'd been given a message that she couldn't remember, but it came from Atlantis. And mm -hmm. the people that she saw on the craft that were her friends were also the people that were part of her group as light workers in Atlantis. Yeah. But then she was seeing this script and aware that there was something that was buried. Mm -hmm. And Part of that indicated something under the Bermuda Triangle. What we, what I found out a week later was this um, interview with Dr. Michael Sala and JP, who was a military whistleblower, talking about also something under the, you know, some huge craft arc mm -hmm. under the Bermuda Triangle, and you needed a certain consciousness to get in it. So I didn't know anything about this until this week later, this other information came in. And when it happens like that, I always know there's more to the story. Yeah. To cut a long story short, a lot of what Beth told me about what she saw and what she experienced, combined with this whistleblower, um, and again, Tony Rodriguez um, is part of this remote viewing group, and he mm -hmm. also went in there and found that it had a consciousness and it only let certain people in because of that consciousness. And there was um, beings there in stasis, as well as beings that were being grown to pilot the craft. And so it looked like it wasn't going to be long before it surfaced. Wow. Did, now, you, say, did you say grown? They were being grown? Yeah, because the pilots are connected to the consciousness of the craft. Mm -hmm. And so if you like, in any way, you know, they, they've got the ability to um, instigate um, the growing of a, a conscious, a, a being so yeah. that contains the consciousness that is in alignment with the, the craft, which has a consciousness as well. Now, mm -hmm. added to that, 
I was very interested because about um, men, a few years ago, I read a book, Transylvanian Sunrise, and part of it's Peter Moon, talking about the Busetti Mountains in Romania. And they had found under a sphinx there, this huge cavern that required the right consciousness to go in, in into it. And when they got mm. in, they found all this ancient technology. Wow. You, uh, you know, information on the origin of humanity, the story behind it, the beings that have been on the planet, everything. And so I said to Tony, I said, can you see if it's, there's anything else there that relates to the one that's in, in the Bermuda Triangle? Because I kept thinking that, that, that they're connected in some way. Mm -hmm. He went in, he saw the cavern. He not only saw that and the technology along with Beth and others, but also saw a huge pyramid under that, huge, mm -hmm and a craft with the same things going on in the craft that you know are being in stasis all this kind of thing so where we've got to but what has come forward since then and there's lots of more evidence too there's a gentleman um john charles boyan who's mm -hmm. canadian who's talking about being shown one in um japan mm -hmm. under under mount fuji and he's been taken there hmm. and he was transported. He said there's a portal in the craft that goes actually to, um, I've forgotten the name of the, the volcano in a uh, mountain in um, Hawaii, but we now find out. So there's one in Japan, Hawaii. Um, and the indicator is there's, there's some, there's at least one in Brazil, maybe two. We feel there's one in Australia, and I've got other evidence that seems to come up from that. So what I'm really saying is it seems like they're across the planet, and there's probably other places. Tibet's another one that's come up. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting to me, because in 2003, when the US went into Iraq and said that Saddam Hussein had um, weapons of mass destruction, they'd gone into what they really were going in for was the ancient technology that was found there. And the Baghdad Museum was raided. And I remember hearing this from a, an intuitive, and I asked somebody in American intelligence if this had any veracity at all. This is in 2003, and I thought it was a, a little bit too much for me to swallow. And he said, don't talk about it. Don't mention it. Don't ever talk about it again. Wow. And that was in 2003. So it's like the universe, you know, how you you get something new to you and, and then you start to see all the connections. And that's so the space arcs are real. They appear to be um, activated through consciousness. Mm -hmm. and this is why I think now we're becoming aware of them, because they're going to, I think, show themselves at some point, whether that's what they call the event, because mm -hmm. lots of into something very big is going to happen soon. Or yeah. not, I, I can't say, but yeah. certainly it's intriguing because I don't know how long you can keep that kind of information or technology away from the general public. You know, I don't see how you can because it's it's too incredible. Right. And that speaks volumes that it's people are starting to have memories or experiences on these right now. <laughs> like, yeah. So something's probably going to be happening happening soon or right around the corner. <laughs> well, it soon certainly seems to be what a, a many are tapping into and they're feeling this sense of anticipation, sometimes even anxiety. Um, and I've got something to do, but I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> kind yeah. of thing. Almost like they're waiting for something to happen to trigger that awareness. And I think there is a protocol that we may have within us that will get activated when we're needed to work from an, a completely different level. And that's what maybe is what's going to be part of this trigger of consciousness that, you know, is happening. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, there was something that you were talking about uh, on another interview about downloads and symbols and how it's all about timing. I think that can tie into that pretty well. Um, I have a lot of people on my channel who have experiences, but they don't know quite what it means or they see things and they don't know what it means. Um, symbols, maybe like ancient language, but they don't know what it means. Um, 
So I just thought that was a, a really good point that you were talking about how you may see these things and receive these downloads, but you may not understand them until the time is right. And it's all about timing. So it seems like we're in a really, really big preparation phase right now. Um, yeah. Do you have anything to add to that that comes to mind on that? Well, it's been something that I've been intrigued by right from almost the beginning of my research was what is this? Um, and one of the first to show me the incredible artwork and symbols and scripts was a lady, young lady. She's not so, she's a mother of three now, bless her. But she, her name Tracy Taylor, I mentor in both my books. And she was the first one to show me what she was bringing through and bringing through things, artwork, at a fantastic rate of speed. It wasn't like her imagination could get in the way. It was just coming to her. Since that time, I mean, thousands of people have, have come to me or, or been in touch with me bringing in these strange symbols, different kinds of writing, different kind of star languages often that will come in when they're doing healing or they're just relaxed and they'd be doing this writing. Some of them could read it um, and understand it. Others didn't have a clue what it was they were doing. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was in northern uh Queensland in Cairns a young 12 year old I was showing all the scripts and he just he just looked at one of the scripts and read it just translated it all just spontaneously like that wow. so I know some of it can actually be read but some of it I was told was like um, a, a, a software program almost like one symbol could contain as much information as a room full of encyclopedias and wow. you'd think well why would that be downloaded if it can't be decoded or whatever, unless at some point it can be? Mm -hmm. And so some of it is it can be read and translated and sometimes it can't. So there's at least the, the, there's a difference between that. I think there are some that can literally read what they're writing and, and whatever and are aware of the different intelligences that are coming through because there's different intelligences coming with different information and some of them are like shorthand some of them look like Chinese and whatever but there may be a, um, with some of them a sense of what is being said like a feeling or an emotion mm -hmm. and what the uh, lady said it's like that that is going into an energetic field mm -hmm. that's all it to do is to go into the field because it's the field of consciousness mm -hmm. so that's activating and what have you so I think there's multiple purposes and one of the things Tracy told me was also it helps to deprogram some of them are deprogramming the the um the less useful uh programs that have happened to each one of us or whatever and so they're working individually mm -hmm. as well one of the most important parts of that that is um, to me gives validity to the reality of this whole experience is that because you know often the nuts and bolts say you know where's the evidence that they're having contact where's the piece of the spacecraft you know why didn't they bring something back or all this kind of stuff and my answer to that is people don't suddenly start writing strange scripts or doing str unusual artwork and what have you or coming out with different languages that they've no idea where they come from, unless something very real has happened to them, you know, because that's not something the rest, you know, you're going to do normally. That's the evidence that something profound has occurred. And that's your reality is it changes people. It changes the way they look at the world. They change diet. They change the way they lose materialistic values. They look at what they can do to help the consciousness of the planet their whole attitude to life and themselves and um, what they need to be a better person is how they shift. That only happens because of a real experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's incredible. And um, yeah, it just comes to mind recently. I what well, I always, whenever I'm in a very deep state or like, as I'm starting to wake up, I always try to tune in. I'm like half asleep, barely conscious. I always try to tune in and ask for any messages, see what comes through. And just the other day, I got a very kind of like jarring, very vivid, uh, like four symbols. And it was like a burst of energy. I had no idea what it meant, yeah. but I could just feel it was very, very vivid, very kind of like jarring. And um, 
I asked, you know, what's what's been going on the past couple of weeks. They've been having so our family's been having me take it easy, took a little bit of time off the pat, podcast and all that. And they were saying coding, like coding, reprogramming, essentially. So that aligns perfectly with uh, with what you were saying. Some of these symbols and downloads, even if we don't, you know, have like a, a paragraph translation, it's breaking down old programming and helping to activate new things in the DNA also. Uh, so yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I wanted to ask about the DNA, the holographic DNA. So I, uh, DNA is actually one of kind of the, the main things that the star beings started sharing mm -hmm. with me whenever I started seeing their ships and then a communication began to develop. They would actually communicate with me through the clouds. And then mm -hmm. as I worked on my third eye, I began receiving like telepathic images uh, and they would create strands of DNA in the clouds. And, and that's how they started teaching me about it and, and about activating uh, my DNA. So that's something that I really heavily focus on because I've been able to activate so many new gifts and abilities mm. uh, from focusing on the DNA. It's really incredible. Uh, in another interview, you mentioned how the DNA is it's holographic and something about wormholes mm. that can that can actually help you access uh, information to other places through the DNA. Do you want to speak on that? I just thought it's just mind boggling. <laughs> I, I have difficulty um, saying the names of the scientists, the Russian scientists, yeah. um, how DNA can alter the um, the nature. Uh, sorry, words can actually alter the nature of DNA. So that's why um, affirmations, because it's just a frequency. But what yeah. they discovered was there was a holographic nature to DNA that they access, they contain miniature wormholes into other realities. So, you know, when we get intuition, we wonder how we get that knowing, that sense um, or that intuition or we, we get these um, light bulb moments and what have you sometimes it's because we're actually putting out a frequency that we want to understand something you know how you notice and I, I say this as a, a way of normalizing it if you like you know when someone's pregnant for example mm -hmm. up to that point they don't really take much notice maybe of other pregnant people and what have you and all of a sudden everywhere they look there's people that are pregnant it's like you know how why am I suddenly noticing all of this? Or if you're looking at something, like I was looking at the arcs, for example, all of a sudden I'm getting all this information coming from other sources because what this seems to be is as, as you put out a frequency or an inquiry into the, the quantum hologram, you're, you're actually going to the frequency of that information and pulling it to you. And you think, oh, that was coincidence. That was a synchronicity. What you're actually doing is you're creating that. You're creating it because you're putting out on a frequency. I want to know about this. And and they proved that what, what DNA is, is it's a portal. It's a portal to other realities beyond space time. And that's why, you know, certain things like intuition work, that knowing, that sensing, because you're actually getting information multidimensionally through those portals. I, I you know, I can go into the science of it, but, you know, I'd need to to read it out in, in a concise form. So, but I've got it in my presentations, mm -hmm. how they found that out. And mm -hmm. it, it also shows why human language is so powerful on people and why affirmations work because the language is a frequency that changes the, con the configuration of the DNA. And you don't, they said you don't even have to cut out certain parts of the DNA to rearrange it, if you've got the right frequency, the, the frequency will do it. Just like you can reprogram a negative belief, for example, if you say it, the, um, some, that, you know, that's why affirmations work. If you yeah. say it enough, you can override the other negative programming and, and alter that so that you change. And right. it really is, you know, interesting to tell people there's so much you can change about things. What people don't realize is that up to seven, your hard drive takes on everything that you learn and experience. And if you're being told at three or four, you're stupid or you'll never be anything or whatever, even if you end up being a quantum physicist, part of you will still believe you're stupid because mm -hmm. you had nothing to deny that 
once you get to seven, your conscious mind comes in and edits what it says it doesn't like or it doesn't think is real. But before that, you you will believe virtually everything that you're taught. Mm -hmm. And so that's why so many people who can be quite quite amazing still don't think they're good enough or whatever. And it's often some message that they got when they're young. So what this also says is you can change that. If you're aware of a negative programming, if you are able to get to a point where you find the affirmation that that resonates with you, you can mm -hmm. change that program into, into a truth. I mean, it's, it's something I've looked into because I've been a hypnotherapist for 30 plus years. And it's, it's amazing what people have taken on board as a small child and what have you that's not true and not relevant only because they were vulnerable to it but what they were saying was it actually affects the dna yeah that it actually changes the configuration of dna so it's very powerful that we keep positive affirmations and and positive way of thinking because that literally does affect every cell of our bodies and i'm not even talking about just that water itself is programmable yeah. So again, what you say to somebody, we're nearly seventy percent water. If you're mm -hmm. constantly getting something negative at you, it's mm -hmm. changing the frequency of your water as well. Because Masaru Emoto showed it beautifully in his his, his um, understanding of messages in water. So it's all these things that help us to empower ourselves. The more we understand, right? Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. In that, uh, essentially. Like I said, I was super new to all of this. These yeah. extraterrestrials are starting to teach me about things, teaching me about uh, DNA, and that's what they would have me do. They would have me sit there. I would sit there every day, and I would meditate with them, and I would repeat in my mind, I am activating my dormant DNA. I am remembering who I truly am, you know, on and on in my, my favorite affirmations, and I would do that every single day. And it's amazing the quantum leaps yeah that you can make from doing that yeah it's beautiful <laughs> well, it's, what it is lily is it's empowering and people you know often feel very disempowered on this planet i mean right from the word go most of us are told we're not good enough you know that we need pieces of paper to to feel good about ourselves you know um because that's the only way we're ever going to get anywhere so all this kind of information is really hard especially for the youngsters that are faced with they've got to compete with others to be proved that they're okay and what have you when in fact none of that is true and what's so hard for the star seeds is they're already highly aware they're very empathic they tune into negative as well as positivity and what have you and feel overpowered and many of them because they're sensitive get bullied at school yeah. so again they're so there's many things that they face it's not a kind world we yeah. live in it's a very aggressive, um, difficult, challenging place to be. And we've got all these beautiful souls coming in that are coming from all places in the universe. And they're coming with a mission and a, a plan. But they're also, many of them, met very, very sensitive yeah. and need nurturing and supporting. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, we, we have a big problem with loving ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. That was another big one. So besides like the DNA activation, my star family would literally have me. I remember like walking back and forth on the front porch uh, one night, just repeating affirmations that I didn't really believe until I believed them. And, and it started to come uh, more naturally to say it out loud. It's so powerful. But yeah, you're right. We've got um, a lot of reprogramming to do and healing. <laughs> But good thing, uh, our intention is very powerful and the frequencies are really supporting it. And we have so much benevolent help with uh, our star families and everything. So that's awesome. Well, it's also tr trusting that inner awareness that you have. Mm -hmm. and, and for many people, just knowing you're supported by the non-physical realm from all of these intelligences and beings. And also to, you know, for some that might be they connect to their angels yeah. Um, or, you know, their spirit guides or whatever name they want to give them for others. It may be light beings or, you know, um, if they connect to, you know, some of the other star systems or whatever. You've got all of that support there. You've just got to be open to their guidance. And often mm -hmm. their guidance comes when you're quiet, you just sit still and you allow that to come in. It's really not rocket science. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You have to be open to receive it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see if there was anything else. Um, I wanted to mention something else that I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, in another interview, you said that 75% of contact is out of body, not even physical. I just thought that was super interesting. There's so much going on in the astral and probably like, you know, while we're sleeping that we have uh, no idea about. So I just thought that was uh, pretty fascinating. Um, do you have anything that you wanted to add on that? I think it's a really important statistic. And we got that through the big survey that we did um, some years ago now, where we asked 4,200 individuals about their experiences. There were 600 in-depth questions. So it was a very important one. Um, uh, in fact, the book, I'm just trying to remember its name. Oh, yeah, Beyond UFOs is where we put all the statistics. And the one thing that was very difficult for people, still very much in the nuts and bolts of ufology, you know, where's, where's the tangible evidence and all the rest of it. And, of course, it's even more difficult when you discover that out of that 4,000, most of their, they said, most of their interactions, 75% were out of body. They'd go on the craft out of body as a consciousness. Wow. And let me explain to some what that actually means. So only 25% was physical. And I had evidence of this in a number of uh, cases. One of them I remember was a young woman who saw herself in a little gray body on board the craft as a scientist and she's I said what are you doing she said well I'm a scientist on board craft and I'm in a, a different form so I said so where's your human body <laughs> and she said oh it's, it's sort of over there almost like waiting for her but it was obviously not moving and it was just waiting wow. so I said well how do you get back to your human body and she described this ball of light leaving the ET gray body and moving and reanimating a human body. Wow. So it's not just that their consciousness goes often as a ball of light. It's for mm -hmm. many that Merkaba, the light body, but they may actually go into another body on board craft. And an eight year old said a similar thing to me. Also, he said that he, he relates his ancestors of the mantis. So mm -hmm. when he dies, he's going back to being a mantis. But he explained that when he's gone on board craft, sometimes he evaporates, he calls it evaporation, into a mantid body. And I said, well, how does that how does that feel? And he said, oh, OK, you know, um, but different. And then obviously comes back and he called it evaporation because <laughs> he was, <laughs> eight. you know, that was the way he described it. That's just two examples. Wow. Of them going into another form on board craft. So they don't just go necessarily just as a consciousness. They may, in fact, perform some things. Some have said that they, you know, they piloted spacecraft. Um, so some they've been looking after the baby hybrids or whatever. So are they all in their physical human body? Maybe not. Maybe they also uh, move into an avatar. Wow. What's whenever you just said, whenever you just said some may be looking after the, the, the baby hybrids i just like i felt that <laughs> i was like oh I, th I think i'm doing that at some point <laughs> okay. well that's telling you something yeah definitely so that's that's really interesting so whenever i guess whenever their they their consciousness goes into this other body into their this et body then suddenly they they remember and know you know what they're doing i guess that's just so fascinating there's so oh. much more, <clears throat> yeah. excuse me, <clears throat> there's so much more we don't understand. Right. And that's the problem for us in human form. We get bits of things. Yeah. And because we're perhaps fearful of what we might find out, we shut it down. When in fact, the more you explore, the more you understand. Mm -hmm. But you've got to transcend the human fears to allow yourself to remember and then when you do, you can really start connecting the dots, but you've got to be ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. And something that I've uh, learned, remembered, uh, was reiterated just through listening to some of your uh, 
interviews and content is you really can't put a cap on what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. So many things that we just do not understand and so much is possible. So um, I guess I've kind of caught myself recently shutting down. Oh, that's not possible. Or, oh, no, it's probably not that when really. I mean, it, it can be endless possibilities. <laughs> well, one of the things that I, I've often stated, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Um, and the, the one thing in my work, more than anything, I've realized I can't have boundaries. Mm -hmm. Because how can I create boundaries when I don't know what I don't know? So the the thing is, what if I get something that's extraordinary that I struggle with, I'll sort of put it in a little box and say, well, if that's got validity, I'm going to get more information on that at some point. Yeah. And as I find that I do, ultimately, I may pull that out of the box and say, oh, well, I've got this, this and this. So, I mean, things like missing pregnancies were very difficult for people to accept that there was such a thing as um, people having these missing pregnancies and they were ending up as being hybrids or whatever it is. That was very out of you know, way out um, at, at, at the time, for example. Now nobody thinks anything of that. There are many things that initially that I really struggled with to start with until I got enough information. Think, well, it's there's too much to say that that's not real now. Yeah. So I learned that I can't put boundaries on the learning because the learning keeps going. And I just realized how little I know. I, you know, really all it does is remind me that I just got, I'm just going to have to keep moving forward and expanding whether, you know, it's, I struggle with it or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The universe is, uh, there's surprises around every corner too. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Every day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I guess to wrap it up, is there anything that you would like to share about anything else you'd like to add about things that you're, you're seeing or that's going on recently or, and also what you're up to, if there's anything you'd like to share with the audience and then where they can find you? Well, you can find me very easily. You go on Google and you type in my name and my website will come up or my Facebook or whatever. So I'm not hard to find. What I would say to people is if you are having experiences, I hope that you understand that you're not alone, that there are not just thousands, not just millions, potentially billions of people around this planet that are having experiences because it's a consciousness worldwide. And because you don't understand it, it can be scary, especially if other people around you don't understand it. But honor the way you feel, honor your understanding, because you came into this planet with all the tools you need to deal with anything that comes up. So it's about you trusting yourself because you are the, the expert on you. No one else can judge that you because they're not you. So, you know, the most important thing is honoring your own awareness, your own wisdom, your own understanding. And the more you do that, the more answers you're going to get. And the more that you can not only be fully yourself, but you can actually be more of a, uh, this wonderful awakening that's coming to this planet. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing and for coming on the show, Mary. And for everybody in the audience right now, please give this video a like. Feel free to drop a comment. And I will have all of Mary's information in the video description. So make sure to go check her out. And I will see you later, Star Brothers and Sisters. Bye. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please give this video a like and drop a comment. Show Mary Rodwell some love. I hope you have a wonderful evening. And don't forget, I have a variety of different workshops and sessions available in the video description. And I will also be speaking in Mount Shasta, California, this July 2024. You can find more information on the promise revealed.net.